All right. Good morning. Welcome to Redemption Hill Church. If you're new with us this morning, my name is Aaron, and I serve as one of the pastors here at Redemption Hill. So glad you're here. Well, if you brought your Bible this morning, please turn with me to the book of Ruth, chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible this morning, we do have a stack of Bibles uh, right over on this side of the room on the countertop over there. Actually, do we have only Spanish Bibles this morning? Does anybody see that? Do we have English ones? We, we probably only have Spanish Bibles this morning, so if that would serve you, grab one of those. We're on page 144. What is that in, what is that in Spanish, Ricky? There you go. I'm not even going to try that. All right. Well, this morning we're looking at Ruth chapter 3. We're continuing our series in the book of Ruth for the last few weeks. We're in a, a four-week series on the book of Ruth. And, uh, and this morning, we, we turn to chapter 3, which is really the decisive, climactic turning point in the book of Ruth. So this morning, things actually get kind of dicey. We see some, some shady stuff going on. And so buckle up, because it's going to be a fun ride. Well, what we're going to see this morning is we see the matriarch of the family, Naomi, plotting a plan to provide a husband for Ruth. And this plan is, like I said, it's kind of shady, could very likely end in disaster because you see it and you're going to read it and you're going to be kind of cringing saying, oh man, maybe you've read this book before, so it's not actually like you're actually sitting on the edge of your seat, but you should be. The original hearers would have been sitting on the edge of their seat. And so what we want to see is that, is that in the midst of all this, when Naomi and Ruth and, and Boaz are wondering what's going on, wondering if God's at work, we see God working behind the scenes, accomplishing his good plan through his people at just the right time. And this chapter offers real hope to you and to me because we come in and not all of our lives are squeaky clean, right? Some of us can, can regularly find ourselves in shady situations. Sometimes it's because of something that we've done or something that somebody else has done to us or put us in. And so at times we don't really know what the right thing to do is. So what we want to find ourselves in, we, we just find ourselves in this hard spot and we have to make a decision and then we, and then we make one. But what we'll see today is that God calls us to wait on him and to trust in his provision. We'll see that God rewards those who trust in his character and his timing. So here's the deal. I am praying that this morning that, that for everyone here, whether it's for the first time ever or, or just in a new and fresh way, that you experience uh, what Paul prayed for in Ephesians 3, that you would know the height and the length and the depth and the width and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge for you and that that would affect you, that that would stir your affections for Jesus Christ, our Savior. And if you're here this morning and, and you're not a Christian, um, I'm so glad that you're here. And I would just pray this morning that the Lord would open your heart, that you would hear God speaking to you, that you would sense his, his presence, that you would experience his nearness in a way that you never have before. So let's pray, and then we'll, uh, and then we'll get to work here. Well, Father, we do thank you, Father, for your holy word. You are a speaking God. You have not left us alone without any guidance, but you have revealed yourself to us through your holy word. You have sent your son, Jesus Christ, perfect God-man, to live the life that we are called to live, to die the death that we deserve, that we can have life and righteousness in you. Father, we thank you that you've spoken to us this morning. I pray, God, that you would be with us, that your Holy Spirit would work among us. Help us to see the truth of your word. Father, help us to see your glory and to receive help and hope for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's get to work. So if you haven't been here the last couple of weeks, uh, let me just kind of catch you up to speed a little bit. So the book of Ruth in the Old Testament we see here, uh, we have these three main characters, Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. But the, the story starts with a different guy, Elimelech, who is married to Naomi and leads his family out of Bethlehem because of a famine in the land, and they go into the land of Moab. Now, Israel, the original audience, would have heard this, and they would have gasped because they shouldn't leave the promised land, especially to go to Moab, which was the land of the enemy, right? So Elimelech leads Naomi and their two sons into Moab, and sure enough, right off the bat, their sons get married to Moabite wives. And all of a sudden, I mean, right at the very beginning of the story, uh, Elimelech and the two sons all die, leaving Naomi and Ruth and Orpah, three widows, childless, and in an enemy land. So then what we see is that Naomi hears that God has visited Bethlehem and that he's restored food to the land. And so she says, let's go back to Bethlehem. But she looks at her two daughters-in-law and basically says, you're young, you're childless. Why don't y'all stay here? 
find new husbands, have a life. You're too young to be going on with me. I'm a bitter widow. And so one of them does this. One of the Orpah stays. She says, hey, that's cool. I'm going to stay here, and I'm going to have a, have a life here. Ruth vows to Naomi. It's this astounding prayer uh, that she basically says, wherever you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your gods will be my God. So she vows an, uh, you know, just this vow of fidelity to Naomi. And so, so chapter 1 ends with Naomi and Ruth walking into Bethlehem. And they're alone, and they're not sure what they're going to do. Ruth is a Moabite uh, woman walking into Israel. And Naomi is walking in, and she's seeing people that she knows. And she's telling everybody, I am a bitter woman because I left here full, and God re returned me empty. So she's bitter. Then in chapter 2, last week we heard from, from John that, uh, that these two women are trying to figure out what they're going to do to, uh, to find food and a family. And so Ruth goes out into a field to try to get some grain. Now, she just happens to end up in the field of a man named Boaz. And Boaz just happens to uh, show up at just the right time while she's working there. And she happens to catch his eye. And the rest, as they say, is what dreams are made of, right? Fairy tale ending. When Naomi finds out whose field she in, she excitedly tells Ruth, this is Boaz. He's a relative of ours. He, this man is an eligible man for marriage. To, he's uniquely qualified to care for us, to provide for us, to protect us, and to, and to bring us under his care. And so Naomi says to Ruth, stay in his fields. Every day you go to his field. You stay, ne stay next to his women. You will be safe there. You'll be provided for there. And so she does that week after week. It's in the harvest season. This is the middle of the barley harvest, which is like a two-month time period. Day after day, week after week, she's in Boaz's field, which leads to the most anticlimactic and disappointing ending to, the, to chapter 2 when it says that Ruth lived with her mother-in-law. So there's no fairy tale wedding that happens there. You're disappointed. The food's been taken care of. They have enough grain probably for the rest of the year, but there's no family in sight. Still no children. So now we're at Ruth chapter 3. So that brings us to our text. And, um, and what we're going to do this morning, as we do each week, is we're just going to kind of walk through the story line by line, verse by verse. Uh, and we're just going to kind of pause and put ourselves in the story a bit. And we're going to try and feel what's going on, try to imagine the scene, and to hear what the original hearers were hearing, to put ourselves in the middle of the story and to learn more about God and his will for our lives. So let's just start right here at Ruth chapter 3, verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? So right off the bat, we see that Naomi, the bitter woman of chapter 1, remember, she, she's a bitter woman who's just kind of depressed and, and focused on herself and focused on inward. You see her, the picture you have is her just kind of moping around and, and, and woe is me, right? She's a victim. But now we see that she's no longer moping about. She's making plans. Okay, so she's saying, hey, I, I'm, I'm going to focus on you, Ruth. I want to help you find a husband. Um, people that see themselves as victims rarely make plans. Usually they sit around blaming, blaming others for their circumstances and for all their troubles. They're hopeless, and their bitterness robs them of their ability to, to move forward with purpose and hope into the future. So what changed for Naomi? What, why is she she's so different here? We see a shift in her countenance. Bible scholar Ian Duguid wrote a commentary on this book, and he says that throughout the first two chapters, Naomi was consumed with only three people, me, myself, and I. She had turned inward, consumed by grief and bitterness, and cut off from those around her. Now, last week, um, John introduced us to this, to this Hebrew word. Y'all remember, remember the Hebrew word that he introduced us to? Uh, it was hesed. So we don't always quote Hebrew because neither of us actually know Hebrew, but we read commentaries that, that tell us these words. Uh, so this is a really important word. Okay? It's not just a cool Hebrew word to say, I know Hebrew has said, but it's a very important word that's going to continue to play in this chapter today and in the next chapter next week as well. Uh, there's really not a word in English that translates has said very well. You can see it's, it's translated here kindness, right? Well, it's translated that way throughout the book, but, but really, if you, want to, if you want to understand what has said is, you try to imagine uh, different words, because it really takes a number of different English words to make it up. So you take kindness and love and loyalty and faithfulness and grace and mercy and compassion, and you mash those up into one word, and that's, and that's has said. So every time I say has said, you think 
kindness, love, loyalty, faithfulness, grace, mercy, compassion, right? Because it's a lot faster just to say it that way. So what seems to have happened here is that over the course of the first two chapters, we see Naomi experiencing God's said, We see him, her experiencing God's loving kindness toward her and providing for her and going before her. And, and as we see this, we see that her heart, her heart is being softened, right? So now she has some hope. Now she's saying, hey, I can, we can move forward here. Uh, I can make some plans. Maybe now she's re- starting to recognize that maybe God wasn't really to blame. Maybe he's not out to get her, right? Maybe she's t- starting to take um, responsibility for her own actions and to repent of, of, of not doing that and putting it off on everybody else. We saw that Naomi was bitter in the first two chapters. Well, as we said, bitterness turns us inward um, into self-depression and self-absorption. But repentance, true repentance, draws our attention away from ourselves and onto others, especially into God. And so this repentance is the result of coming to grips with the grace and love of God for us, his has said, right, his loving kindness. So what we see here in, Na- in Ruth chapter 3, verse 1, is a changed Naomi. She's been changed by the grace and the love of God. So Naomi turns to Ruth and says, my daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? So, the, so just to be clear here, what, what Naomi is saying is, Ruth, you need a husband. You need a man. Because once she has a husband, she'll find rest, the comfort and security that she is longing for, the provision, the protection. And here's Boaz, who, who God just happened to bring into the field, where Ruth just happened to be gleaning. Sorry, I know this is distracting. I have no earlobe, so this thing doesn't want to stay. I need a staple. <laughs> now, in chapter 2, we see the emergence of Boaz, and we learn that he's a relative of theirs, one of their redeemers. Hope is found, and he has great favor on Ruth and Naomi. But it's been, <laughs> I know, but it's been six weeks, maybe seven, and they, have, they still haven't seen their dreams realized. They st- he's still not proposing. He's not talking relationship. So now what? He hasn't moved things forward, and Ruth can't just go up to him in the middle of the field while, while they're working and ask him about marriage. So Naomi comes up with a plan. She's going to play matchmaker. Maybe some of you can identify with this. You see the singles around you, and you feel compelled to help play matchmaker. Well, that's what Naomi is doing. There's a little more responsibility because she's the mother-in-law. So let's look at verse 2. Is not Boaz our relative with with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. So pause here. Two things about Boaz. One, we're reminded here that he's a relative, and he's a relative that is uniquely suited to, he's an eligible bachelor. Eligible bachelor particularly for Ruth, because he, can, he has a responsibility through the Mosaic Law to provide for her in the event of the death of her husband, because he is a relative of theirs. Okay? So we're going to see more of this in chapter 4, the idea of Boaz as a relative redeemer, a kinsman redeemer. And then second, we see that Naomi points out that he's going to be winnowing barley on the threshing floor tonight. So what would happen is at the barley harvest, at the end of the barley barley harvest, you have after all the barley has been harvested, you'd have the secluded area, most likely up on a hill uh, somewhere in the evening where there was a cool breeze that was coming across. And what you would have, what you would, what they would do basically is they would take pitchforks, okay, and they would they would get the grain and throw it up in the air. Did you bring a stapler? It's ugly, but... That's great. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> How's that? Is that more distracting or less distracting? <laughs> All right, good. That's great. So they would, ha- they would take the, bit, the pitchforks and they would throw the barley up in the air. Okay? Now, as they threw the barley up in the air, what would happen is the wind is coming through and it would carry away all the chaff, and, and the grain, which was heavier, would fall back to the ground. Okay, so, they're, so they're sifting it. So they're getting rid of all this. Um, so this is what winnowing is. And so this is where Naomi unfolds her plan, and this is where things get a little dicey. So look with me at verse 3. This is Naomi's plan. She says, Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself. Put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor. This is the middle of the night. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. 
Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. Now, if you are hearing this in the original context, you are blushing big time right now. So let's look at this a little at a time. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself. Well, it was a hot climate in Bethlehem, right? And they didn't have deodorant. Uh, so she would have anointed herself with some kind of perfumed oil to counteract the bodily odors that would have been less than pleasant. Remember, Ruth was a working girl. She was out in the fields all day. She wasn't sitting in air conditioning all day. So you get the idea. <laughs> Perfume helps. Then she tells her to go put on her cloak and to go down to the threshing floor. But don't just rush right up to Boaz. Oh, no. You want to wait. Wait until he is finished eating and drinking. Wait until he is happy. Wait until he is satisfied. Now, there was probably wine involved, but we don't want to get the wrong idea because there's no reason, there's no indication at all that he had gotten drunk. The original audience may have heard, um, may have started to think of, uh, this sounds an awful lot like what happened with uh, Lot's daughters uh, when they approached him after he was drunk or when, Ta when Tamar approached drunk Judah, her father-in-law as a prostitute. Um, these are Tamar and, and Lot and Judah. These are all relatives of theirs, so they descended from them. So the suspense here is appropriate because what they're wondering is, is that what's going to happen here? Is something scandalous about to happen? Will Boaz and Ruth do what is right in the eyes of the Lord, or will they do what is right in their own eyes? So after he's eaten and his heart is happy, when Boaz lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then, and this word then is important because this is a euphemism in the original language where basically Naomi is saying, okay, now this, this is crucial. Here's what you're going to do. And this raises the tension and sets the stage for the sentence. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. Okay, this is where it gets difficult because these words are all charged, right? Uncover, feet, which could also just be legs, and lie down. This is not the kind of thing that you do with just anybody on any day. So what is Naomi up to here? What exactly is going on? Uncover his legs, lie down. This is what she's supposed to do. This is what a Moabite worker is supposed to go up and do to the owner of the field. And Ruth responds, all that you say I will do. So this could get ugly. There's major risk exposure here. There's risk to Ruth's character. There's uh, risk to her social standing and security. Major risk to Boaz as well, because he was a fine, upstanding man in the community. After all, it's late at night. He's eating a good meal, probably had some wine. And now he lays down, and there's a, there's a woman there. He wakes up and sees her. If she approached him during the day when others were around, no big deal. But here in the dark of night when everybody's asleep, this is a bad situation. Earlier, we see Naomi so concerned for, uh, for Ruth's well-being, for her security, that she tells her to stay close to Boaz's girls because in another field, she might be harmed even during the day. But now, Naomi seems prepared to risk everything in telling her to go down to the threshing floor in the middle of the night and to lie down next to this man. Pastor and author Sinclair Ferguson is really helpful here because before, you know, our, our imagination can run away, but what, what he says is we must not totally misjudge Naomi. She has a sense of what God's providential purposes might be, but hunches about what God is doing should not be turned into schemes by which we engineer circumstances in order to bring those purposes to pass in an accelerated way. Naomi recognizes what God might be doing, but she does not submit herself to the principle that God's purposes are to be fulfilled in God's ways and at God's time. Sometimes we may look at other people's decisions in life and we make judgments. We can look and we think that we know what we should do or what we would do in their situation or what they should do in their situation. Then we rush to criticize them. We might gossip about them. We might, we might turn uh, kind of a holy, because as Christians we don't gossip. We, we pray for them publicly with others. Uh, hey, can we pray for so-and-so, that you know, sin that they're caught in? But sooner or later, we find ourselves in a situation where right or wrong isn't that clear to us. Or the way out of wrong and back to right is blurry. Every choice seems to be, seems to be mixed with, with good and bad. And it doesn't seem like a clear, obvious, we don't have the, the benefit of the hindsight. You know, we can all read this situation and we can see, that, okay, this is bad. You don't do this. Um, but in the middle of our situations, oftentimes it's not as clear. And we hope that others don't look at us and judge us. Maybe you find yourself there right now. 
And what you need is God's grace to wait on him, remembering, remembering that the Bible doesn't say that God helps those who help themselves, which may not necessarily be what Naomi is doing. We want to be charitable there. But that God rewards those who trust in him, who go about things his ways, in his timing, waiting on him, committing your ways to the Lord, trusting on him to act on your behalf. So let's move on to the next section, verse, verses 6 through 8. Let's read this together. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. So the setting here is the middle of the night, okay? Okay, so this is, this is pitch black. We live in a city here. Uh, most of us probably have lived most of our lives in a city. Some of us may have lived out in the country. If you've ever been out in the country, maybe you've been on a camping trip, you know what black is like. Or maybe you've gone to the, um, to the caverns up the road in Georgetown. If you've ever gone to the caverns and gone down into the caverns and they turn off the lights and you literally can't see your hands in front of your face, that's what this is like, okay? So total black. And so it's an appropriately dark setting for a dangerously dark plane. Here's Ruth looking and smelling good, hiding off somewhere quietly, watching the working going on. She sees Boaz, her man, off winnowing. He's, he's working. He's a man. You know, he's throwing up. He's winnowing. She's eager with anticipation. And then the moment comes after the working, after the eating and drinking, that the men go off to sleep. Put yourself there, though. How does she know when he's asleep? It's dark. She can't just go rushing over there. I mean, I don't, know, I don't know what's going on here. Some of you have young kids, and you, you put your kids to bed at night, right? I love bedtime with my kids. I've got three little boys, and our youngest right now, typically at night after his bath, I'll read to him a couple of books, and then I'll lay him down in his crib, and I'll sing quietly over him while I'm just kind of patting him like this. And it's dark in there, but there's, you know, it's not pitch black, and so I'm kind of trying to, trying to see, is he asleep? It's hard to tell. So I kind of slowly, slowly back up. He pops up his head, oh, just, I'm right here. You know, I'm, I'm here, son. It's OK. You know, I just keep singing. That's what I imagine this is like. She's, she's creeping up. She's, she, is he, no, no, I see his eyes, you know, and then, OK, no, it looks like he's asleep now. So she found her moment. And in perfect accord with Naomi's risky plan, she, she creeps up on Boaz, lays down next to him, and uncovers his feet. Now, what happens? By way of contrast to Naomi, we have Boaz, who finds himself, he wakes up, totally innocent here, wakes up in the, in the crucible of temptation, and he's set before us as a model man of God. Here is a man who, despite um, what the circumstances, of course, he desires the best for his life. He likes Ruth. We'll find out that he's, he's really excited about the idea of marriage. But he, he wants to, he's totally committed to God's ways, God's timing, God's purposes in his life. So Psalm 37, 4, one of my favorite verses in the Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. And here is Boaz perfectly fulfilling this. All right, so Boaz is display, displaying what it means to truly trust God in the scene, to wait on him, to do things his way. Obedience to God's commandments, like we see here with Boaz, integrity before God, is a result of a deep-seated confidence in the character of God, in who he is, and the fact that ultimately God is for you. God's not against you. He's not against your good. He's not against your happiness. Oftentimes, uh, people can, can kind of stand far back from Christianity because they see Christianity as a straitjacket. That, well, if, I, if I'm a Christian, I can't have fun. I can't do things that are, that are good for me. God doesn't really know what's good for me. I do. But that's not true. That's not who God is. And so, so we see this in Boaz. So what happens now? Nothing bad happens. OK, there is no hint. While the scene's intense, while the language is a pro provocative, there's absolutely nothing here that suggests anything inappropriate or immoral happened. In fact, we'll see later that both of their character is praised. So we have every reason to believe that Boaz and Ruth conducted themselves in a way that's exemplary for all, displaying an utter trust in God and integrity before him. So Ruth is lying there. She's next to Boaz. She uncovers his feet, maybe his legs. The cold air hits him, and he wakes up you know, to, to wrap his cloak back over himself. 
So as he sits up, he smells the perfume and notices that he's not alone. There's a woman sitting, laying at his feet. So how does he respond? Verse 9, he said, who are you? So he wakes up and he responds with remarkable poise. He doesn't, you don't, I mean, you don't know the tone of his voice, but you don't get the impression here that he wakes up in anger, that he's, that he's, he's rash. Maybe he's re- whispering, he responds calmly, rashly, in display of a God-centered view. Here was a man in whom God had worked his grace deeply. Think for a moment of how Jesus awoke in the storm with his disciples at sea, right? He woke up, he was totally calm. Like Jesus, Boaz's heart and mind were guarded by the peace and love of God. He knew that God was in control. How could you or, you or I respond similarly? It's, you know, Boaz grew up meditating on God's word. He had a life transformed by a renewed mind, a commitment to pleasing God, and, a, and an unswerving confidence that his ways are best, that God is for him. Listen, the fruit of a heart that has been meditating upon God's word enables us to bear this kind of rich fruit of grace. So Boaz displays his integrity in his response to this scandalous situation. He doesn't wake up and yell at her. He doesn't rebuke her for her short-sighted and risky behavior. What are you thinking? Anybody could see us. You're, you're a woman. You're a Moabitess. You're working in the field. I'm an upstanding man. This, is, this looks bad. What if somebody sees us? Rather, we get the impression here that he speaks to her with a tenderness and a graciousness that marks Boaz as exactly the type of man that Ruth needs. So Ruth responds in the second part of verse 9, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Notice here what she doesn't say. This isn't um, earlier in chapter 1, uh, she, she identifies herself as a foreigner. And we see a little bit of a progression through chapter 1 and chapter 2. She's a foreigner. She's a Moabitess, which is an enemy of God's people, to a slave, I'm your servant. Now she says, again, I'm your servant. But this is a different word this time. Again, I don't know Hebrew, but this, this is helpful, okay? Because we have the same word, servant, appearing in our English translation, but it's actually different Hebrew words behind us. So the first time, it's a sifa, which carries with it like a low sense of social standing. So, so a sifa is like, like a, a real sa- servant. You know, you, you command and you tell what to do. But now she calls herself an ama, which in English, again, is just translated servant, but but it carries more the idea of a maidservant than a slave servant and one who would enjoy the privileges. She could be married to him. Now, you wouldn't marry a Sifa, but you could marry an Ama. So she is saying, basically, hey, I am yours. Like, I could be, you could marry me. And then next, she says something very peculiar. She says, spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Spread your wings over your servant. Okay, what is this? This is extraordinary for several reasons. First, we have to understand that by saying this, what she is essentially doing, she is proposing marriage to Boaz. She is going to him and, and asking him to cover her. This, the gesture of a man covering a woman with his garment was, was something that would have been part of the custom of the day. And what it would have signified is the establishment of a new relationship and a symbolic declaration of the husband to provide for his future wife. This is exactly what Naomi had in mind when she put this plan forward as a way of providing rest for Ruth. And remember that in chapter 2, Boaz prayed for her to be blessed by the Lord under whose wings she had taken refuge. So it's the same language that Boaz had prayed for her. So what, what she's saying in a sense to Boaz is, hey, you prayed for me that God would, would protect me under his wings. Now I'm asking you to fulfill that prayer by being God's answer to your own prayer for me. That is fascinating. Ruth is breaking all custom by proposing to Boaz here. Even today, for a woman to propose to a man is unusual. Ruth is a lowly servant, and he is the master. She is an uninvited visitor on his turf. She's a younger woman. He's an older man. She's a foreigner, and he's a native. Not just a foreigner, she's a Moabitess. She is from the land of Moab, which was an enemy of God's people, an enemy of the land of Israel. We might imagine today if Ruth advertised herself on an online dating site in Bethlehem. Hey, guys, I'm a single Moabite woman, widowed and childless, with a mother-in-law to provide for. 
I'm looking for a well-off Bethlehem businessman to marry, and you must love my bitter mother-in-law. <laughs> so how does Boaz respond to this? Boaz's response to, to Ruth's proposal for marriage is as remarkable as her words and deeds. You can't help but love and admire both of these characters. As, they, as we watch their drama unfold. So he responds in four ways. First, he blesses her. Verse 10, he says, may, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness, okay, kindness that the Lord has said, greater than the first, in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. So when he first finds her and discovers her, instead of rebuking her, he blesses her. He addresses her with respect and affection, calling her my daughter. He blesses her just as Naomi had blessed him in chapter 2, verse 20, in response to, to her has said to him. These opening words are extremely important because they, they just, they break the tension. You imagine she's putting herself out there. She's proposing for marriage to this wealthy, older, respectable man, and she's a Moabite. She's a foreigner. She's wondering, how is he going to respond? And now she breathes in a sigh of relief because he's not mad. He's not rebuking her for this. Boaz praises her for her display of said, her display of loving kindness. He says, you have made this last kindness greater than the first. So he's actually praising her for taking the risk that she's taken and coming to him this way and pursuing him as a husband. He praises her for choosing him an older man when apparently there were other potentially more attractive options available to her. But if you're reading this, how is this kindness to him? How is this not just self-interested, self-preservation work on her behalf? Because you're looking at this saying, well, of course she's proposing to him because he's a wealthy older man that, that's going to restore her. So how is this kindness to him? It's in the fact that she appeals to him as specifically as a kinsman redeemer. Because in doing so, she's not acting for her own sake, but she's acting for the sake of Naomi and for the line of her husband, her deceased husband, Malan, to continue. Boaz praises her for this others-oriented posture. She's not looking out for herself. She could have married for love or money, right? He says, you, you have passed up other men, other younger men. She could have married for love or money, but she chose family loyalty instead. She, could have act, she acted neither from passion nor greed. Rather, setting aside her own personal preferences, she chose a marriage of benefit to her family. She reckoned her own happiness as secondary to the provision of an heir for her late husband and Naomi. Such a model of, of selfless concern, it draws your attention to someone else, doesn't it? You remember Philippians 2? How it says, consider others more significant than yourselves, following Jesus. And Jesus teaching that the greatest in the kingdom is everyone's servant. That's what we're seeing here. We're seeing Ruth displaying an others-oriented, I consider others more significant than myself. I am the servant of others. That's what we're seeing here. So Boaz goes on in verse 11, and he, and he makes her a promise. He says, now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. He goes on to comfort her. He tells her, do not fear. Remember, do not fear. That's the most common command in the Bible, which helps us because we're all tempted to fear. We're all tempted to anxiety. And he promises to do everything that she's asking. This is wonderful. And then he goes even further than that. He calls her a worthy woman woman, and a set hayil. This term is only used two other times in the Bible, in Proverbs 12 and in Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31, you remember this chapter? It's the, it's the ideal woman, you know, the woman who works nonstop, who provides for her family, who, who is honorable at the gates. Actually, in the Hebrew canon, in the Hebrew Bible, the book of Ruth is right after the book of Proverbs because they would consider Ruth to be the perfect depiction of the Proverbs 31 woman, of the Asad Hayil, the worthy woman. And so Boaz is giving her this high praise. Imagine how this sounds to Ruth, okay? We all have, we all come in here with our, 
you know, less than squeaky clean records, right? We, we all come in here wondering if, if, if others knew about me. But imagine Ruth. It's not just I wonder if others know about me. She is a broken, widowed, childless, destitute woman from Moab. She's had a hard life. To hear this righteous man praise her in this way, by calling her a worthy woman. Listen, Boaz is elevating her to his own status. He's a worthy man. We know this. And he's saying, you are a worthy woman. You're on my level. You are certainly a woman worthy of marrying me. What an amazing turn of events. Just weeks ago, she was the lowest of the low, begging for scraps as the, circus, as, as the workers went through the fields. And now she has a worthy man of high esteem praising her as a worthy woman. But here's the thing. Get this. Ruth didn't set out to earn this title. She wasn't doing this to be seen by him. She wasn't working to be called a worthy woman. She wasn't trying to earn a reputation before others. And that's exactly why she deserves it. She, Ruth, has gone about seeking to be faithful to her mother-in-law, Naomi. And it was through her faithfulness, through her self-forgetfulness, her sacrificial embodiment of this idea of said by her kindness and loving loyalty to Naomi, that's what won her the praise and the respect of all. He says, what, what is it uh, he says? He says, all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. Everyone knows. This isn't just his, his claim about her. Everybody has seen her and knows that she's a worthy woman. Bible scholar Daniel Block says here that Boaz could have treated Ruth as Moabite trash, scavenging in the garbage cans of Israel and then corrupting the people with this scandalous behavior. But with true has said of his own, he sees her as a woman equal in standing and character to himself. And the whole town agreed. Imagine how her heart must have skipped at this proclamation. And how can one not draw a parallel to our own experience? A Christian is one who has been convicted of his own rebellion against God, one who has said, uh, I once was lost in darkest night. Remember the song that we sang earlier? And thought I knew the way. We thought we had it figured out, but we were rebelling against God. We were convicted of this sin, convicted of our rebellion, of our sin against others, to hear that our sins have been washed clean in the blood of the Lamb, to hear that we are called friend, a son or daughter of God, to be invited to the, to the wedding supper of the Lamb, to be able to sit at the table of Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, who knows all and sees all, and you know, he knows everything about you. And he says, I love you, and I want you in my family. God's grace is so much greater than we can imagine. Pastor Tim Keller often says that the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed than we ever dared believe. Yet, at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. In order to experience this love, though, we must trust God the way that Boaz trusted God, not in scheming and plotting, but in trusting the provision that God brings about. So we move on in verses 12 and 13. Boaz says this. He says, now it is true that I am a redeemer. Yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight and in the morning. If he will redeem you, good. Let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. Okay, we just took a left turn. So here he is praising her. Here he is commending her. And again, you hear wedding bells in the distance. And then he says, now hold on. There's another guy who has rights to you that are more primary than my own. We're so close. We're right here. As much as Boaz would like to marry Ruth, as much as she wants to marry him, Boaz willingly defers to the man who has more primary rights there to her than he does. He's not oblivious to the implications for Ruth, though, because she's hearing this saying, what? Like, you're, you're just giving up on me? 
So he says that if he will redeem her, if this other guy, literally Mr. So-and-so, if Mr. So-and-so will redeem you, fine. But if he does not desire to redeem you, then I will, in fact, redeem you. And he sets about it right away. Boaz's integrity and trust in the Lord, again, here is displayed, and it's astonishing. Adele Berlin writes of Boaz here the following. He said, uh, she says, it is not that by fulfilling his obligation as a redeemer that Boaz appears so loyal to the interests of the family. Rather, the loyalty of Boaz, his loyalty is in his willingness to relinquish that privilege if law or custom demanded it. How many of you have, have been in that situation where, where you see a way to make something happen, but you know that it's a little bit shady the way you want to go about it? And you see and you, you think, oh, man, but the ends justify the means, right? Because the result of it all is going to be good. And so even if we get through it a little bit kind of, kind of dicey, it'll, it'll be okay because it'll all work out. But Boaz doesn't do that here. He could have done that. He could have said, you know what? Easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. Let's just get married, and, and we'll, I'll tell the guy sorry. Rather, he again puts his trust fully in Yahweh, and he unveils his plan to her. So to avoid any appearance of wrongdoing, he tells her to spend the night there and then to leave before anyone would recognize her. He is here once again modeling the same kind of integrity he displayed in chapter 2. Boaz will not take advantage of Ruth. So Ruth lays down. She attempts to sleep. I can't imagine that she would have gotten any, considering the anticipation of the events of tomorrow, thinking tomorrow my life could change. I could have a husband. I could have a redeemer. Everything restored. So before anybody could recognize her, she gets up. He gets up with her. He gives her another gift in sending her back to Naomi in accord with his lavish generosity. You see in verses 14 and 15 um, that he says, bring the garment you're wearing and hold it out. So she held it, and he measured out six measures of barley, and he put it on her. Then she went out into the city. The narrator emphasizes the amount of the gift of barley. Now listen to the six measures. What's a measure? Well, there's different types of measure. It doesn't say what kind of measure. Uh, if it was an ephah, that would be like 180 to 250 pounds. So we don't think that it was an ephah, rather a seah. Six measures, six seahs of barley would probably be like 60 to 100 pounds. That's still impressive. But Ruth, remember, she's not a delicate, frail woman. She's, a, she's out there working in the field. She picks up, you know, she's got this, this sack a hundred pounds, and she's going to walk through the field carrying a hundred pounds up a steep hill back into the town to Naomi. Ruth is not a woman you want to meet in a dark night <laughs> in an alley. Imagine her face as he gives her this gift. And now we have our final scene, the waiting, verses 16 and eight through 18. It says, when, when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Naomi said, how did you fare, my daughter? Literally, it's, who are you, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, these six measures of barley he gave to me. For he said to me, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Naomi replied, she replied, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. If Ruth and Naomi, or if Ruth and Boaz had trouble sleeping that night, imagine what it was like for Naomi. So this is before the, before the day of text messaging. There's no Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or anything else for her to kind of keep up with what's going on. She sent Ruth out in this risky plan. And, and dangerous things could have happened. I mean, she sent her out in the middle of the night, you know, where in the day she'd already told her that it was dangerous out there and to stay close to Boaz women. So she knows it's dangerous. So she's, you, you've got to imagine Naomi pacing her room all night, praying and trying to cast her anxieties on the Lord. And she waits in suspense. So Ruth walks in the door, carrying her 100 pounds of barley. Naomi wants to know what happened. So Ruth tells her everything that he'd done for her. And imagine them both staring at this lavish gift, because this was, this was a lavish gift. This was a serious gift. You know, we can, we can hear like, OK, he gave her some grain. Kind of what's the big deal? Um, a friend of mine just got back from a, a trip to Africa where he was teaching, uh, along with a mission, uh, business principles to African women over in uh, Senegal. And he told me that they had a, 
a contest during that, basically who could come up with the best business plan and, and what that would look like. And the winning team would get, a, um, would get these vats of oil, of cooking oil. So it's kind of like, you know, again, you know, like here you think, okay, thanks for the oil. Um, I would have liked a gift card to, you know, wherever. But there it's a big deal. That was like two weeks or three weeks worth of salary. I mean, it was a big gift for them. And here it's even more than that. This 100 pounds of barley would have lasted them a year easily. So this is a lavish gift. But what Ruth reveals next was even more amazing than the gift itself. Okay, this is where we see, again, God working behind the scenes. The narrator of the book of Ruth waits until now, while Naomi is present, to tell us the words that Boaz had said. He said, you must not return empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Now, why is that? Why did he wait until now? Look, at, look with me, if you can flip back a little bit to chapter 1, verse 21, where Naomi the bitter declares to all, I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So here's Naomi back in bitter land saying, I am empty. God has emptied me. And now Boaz, who's oblivious to this, is telling Ruth, tell your mother-in-law that I did not want you to go back empty-handed. This is like God, you, you know that phrase, it's a God thing? You can imagine Naomi, Ruth saying that it's a God thing. Um, this is like God winking at Naomi right now, whispering to her, I love you. He's showing his said to her through Boaz's generosity. He's showing, I am still working for you. When you see nothing, when you don't know what's going on, I'm at work. I'm providing for you. And these words would have shocked her. God is saying to Naomi, watch how I will provide for you in ways more abundant than you ever could have imagined. And this changes Naomi. She sees that all this time, God has been working for her. This kind of grace, this kind of loving kindness, this kind of said, this kind of grace changes us. Early on for Naomi, it was, I've got to look out for me. If God's not going to work, I'm going to work. But now she's confident in the sovereign hand of God. Now she's trusting in the provision that God will supply. Now she's saying to, to Ruth, wait until you see how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest, but will settle the, settle the matter today. This is, this, is, this is helpful for us. Because when we feel empty, when we think that everything is bleak, there's often much more going on. We can question whether or not God's at work in our lives. We can question, is it ever going to get better? Is he ever going to change? Is my, w will I ever have a child? Will I ever get a job that is better than this? Will anyone ever recognize what I have been through? And it may be just there that God is setting the stage for his greatest deliverance that he's ever set for you, that you'll see abundant provision more than you've ever dreamed. Imagine Naomi standing there telling everybody how God has brought her back empty-handed and the whole time standing next to her is, is Ruth. Ruth is a symbol here of the greatest provision that Naomi could ever imagine. Just a sneak peek into next week, and you know the story is that through Naomi, through Ruth, through Ruth and Boaz, will come seed that David, the king, is born from. And through David's line comes Jesus. Naomi, the empty one, who God has cursed, right? Who she believes God has cursed. God's going to bring the savior of all mankind through her seed. Empty, nothing. And this encourages you and me today. This is the last time that we hear from Ruth in this book. The chapter closes with uncertainty. Things are no longer in their hands. There's no more plotting. They're not in the hands of Boaz either because the other guy, Mr. So-and-so, he could come in and claim Ruth as his own. But things are not lost. They're in the hands of God. And here we finally see them learning to wait on God and to trust in his ways and his timing. Friends, how we live, how we respond to the challenges in our life reveal what we truly believe about God, what we really think deep down about him. The story of Naomi and Ruth and Boaz gives us a hint at the way in which God will ultimately bring about salvation for all the world, 
to his people through Jesus Christ, the great kinsman redeemer of whom his father could tell us, wait, because he will not rest until he is finished, until it is finished. He will perfect what he has started in you. And so as I said at the beginning, my prayer this morning is that when you can't see what God is doing, when you, when you are wondering what he's up to or if he's even there, remember this story. Remember how God acted here. You see his has set on display in the life of Ruth and Naomi and Boaz. And you know that that's his character. The same God that was at work there is at work here. The same God who loved Naomi and Ruth and Boaz loves you and wants good for you. He's not holding back from you. He's calling you to trust his character, to wait on his timing, to trust his purposes, not to give up. Maybe, you, maybe you're here this morning, you identify more with Ruth the Moabitess, the foreigner who doesn't seem to belong. Maybe you look around this room or at others all over your life and you, and you just, um, you say, I, I don't belong here. If they, if they knew who I am, they wouldn't uh, shake my hand the way that they do. Maybe you believe that because of your past, you can't possibly enjoy God's favor. But the truth for you is that like Ruth, the Moabitess, the enemy of God, God has said his loving kindness knows no bounds. We see, that, we see that throughout scripture, the transforming grace of God. The gospel, remember, as Keller says, that we are more sinful and flawed than we ever dared believe. And yet at the same time, we are more loved and accepted than we ever dared hope. Let that soak in. Come to God with your mess, with your junk, with your sin. Ask him to meet you, to reveal his glory, to reveal where he's working. Look at his loving kindness. Look at his character and trust in his hands. Our God is good. His timing is perfect. And his wisdom plans everything for our good. We have every reason to trust in the sovereign hand of God. Please pray with me. Well, Father, I do pray this morning. I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would actively work in our hearts, God. Thank you for your word. Now I pray, God, that you would work your word, your truth into our hearts. Help us, Father. Help us to see your glory. Help us to see your loving kindness for me, for every person in this room, God. That we would all say, surely God is for me. If God is for me, who can be against me? If God, who gave his son to die in my place, how could he hold anything good for me? These are the truths of who you are, Father. I pray, God, that that would shape us. I pray that your grace would change everything about us, that you would give us hope and future and purpose in our lives. Give us joy to speak of your glory. We pray all this in the glorious name of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. grateful for you doing that. Um, I, before we dismiss, I just wanted to seize a moment and uh, mention why we chose to do the book of Ruth uh, as a church. Uh, we're going into a season, Aaron and I feel like the Lord has, has led us to focus in this coming season on what you might call gospel community what it means to be a church, what it means to love one another, to care for one another, to serve one another, really to reflect the gospel in our interactions with one another. Um, that's what we feel like God is leading us to focus on. We're gonna have a series called Gospel Community following next week after Ruth is concluded. It'll go for about uh, eight weeks. And then we're gonna launch a series in the book of Ephesians, which highlights a lot about God's church and the gospel reflected in that community. So that's that's something of a, a an an emphasis that we feel God leading us to focus on. And we wanted to, to start that emphasis in the book of Ruth um, because it's really worthless to talk about loving one another unless we are aware of, overwhelmed by the love of God toward us in Christ. So that's why we wanted to anchor this series in Ruth. It, it's no good telling people or telling yourself, oh, we need to be more loving uh, unless we're first gazing at the generosity, the covenant love of God revealed in the gospel. That, that's the love we should be affected by. And then in our small ways, like Ruth, 
uh, we can reflect and even be instruments of that love toward one another. It always has to be vertical first before it's horizontal. And so as, as Aaron's preaching this morning, I, I just wanted to, to carry that motive into the week. Uh, that like Ruth and like Naomi, we, we have been recipients of the incredible, permanent covenant love of Jesus Christ, forgiving us of our sins, saving us, promising us, promising us eternal rest. And like Ruth, we have the opportunity to sacrificially express love toward one another. So let's just carry those themes into our week. And then as we conclude, Ruth, as we move forward into this next series, as we apply that in all small groups and our, our church life together, uh, that's, that's really what we want to be a mark of our church, overwhelmed by the love of Christ and then loving one another 